Hello and welcome to this film which again is all about um, patterns in the periodic table but here instead of um, discussing things like atomic and ionic radius we're going to be looking at melting points and hopefully by the end of this film um, you'll be able to uh, discuss the melting points of two particular groups of the periodic table that's the alkali metals and the halogens and you'll be able to explain the patterns that we see in terms of the bonding that's present in these elements. Okay, now even if you don't remember, um, which hopefully you do from the first film in the series, even if you don't remember that the alkali metals are in group 1, um, and therefore on the left of the table and therefore likely to be metals, hopefully the name kind of gives it away. Okay, and if they're metals they've got metallic bonding, which we ought to be able to remember from the bonding topic, consists of this, uh, as if you're asked to describe what metallic bonding is, it's this lattice of positively charged ions uh, floating in a sea of delocalized electrons is the analogy that's so often used here okay so this is a reminder of what our metal lattice looks like okay now if you think about what will make a strong metallic bond if it's the electrons holding all these ions together then surely it has to ha has to do with the attraction or the strength of the attraction between these ions and the electrons and more than that it has to do with the attraction between the nucleus of these ions and the electrons because that's where the positive charge resides remember that's where all the protons are okay so if we think about what's going to make a strong bond well it's either going to be a very highly charged nucleus or a very short distance between the nucleus and those electrons or both I suppose okay but if we're looking at the alkali metals right so that's group one remember okay so here we've got lithium sodium and potassium if we're talking about the charge of the nucleus well remember the charge is always going up it goes from 3 to 11 to 19 between these three elements but the core charge, which we introduced in the previous film, the core charge is staying the same. Why is the core charge staying the same? Well, because this outer shell electron might be being pulled by three protons here, but these two inner shell electrons are cancelling two of those out. This outer shell electron here is being pulled in by 11 electrons, but 10 ele uh, by 11 protons, I should say, but 10 electrons here are cancelling out 10 protons. All right, so it really only sees one proton. That's what we mean by core charge. Okay, so they've all got the same core charge, right? But because the number of shells is increasing down this group, this outermost electron is getting further and further from the nucleus. So if the effective nuclear charge or the core charge is staying the same, but the distance between these ions and the electrons or the nuclei and the electrons is getting greater and greater, then we ought to expect the metallic bond to be getting weaker and weaker the bigger the atom becomes. Or in other words, for the metallic bond to be weakening as we go down the group. And if the metallic bond gets weaker, then surely we should expect the melting point to fall as we go down the group. And indeed we do. We start off with lithium, which is quite a hard metal. And we end up with cesium, which is actually a liquid at room temperature. Now if we consider the halogens, which again I'm sure you remember where we find these, if you don't then make sure you remember it soon because it's an important thing to remember. Halogens are in group 7 and therefore this is a group of non-metals. You might remember that all the halogens have the formula, a general formula X2, so we're talking about F2, we're talking about Cl2 and so on. Okay. They're non-metals, so they form covalent bonds with one another. And here's just a little reminder of what covalent molecular substances look like. They've got strong covalent bonds between them. But remember, when we're talking about the melting and boiling points of covalent molecular substances, we're not really considering the strength of these bonds, because these aren't the bonds that break. Okay? It's the forces between molecules, the intermolecular forces, which are much, much weaker than these bonds. These are the things that are going to break. Now, once we've decided that basically the strength of the forces between these molecules is going to be what leads to the different melting points that we see, so strong intermolecular forces will give us high melting and boiling points, 
Now all we need to do now is to decide what type of intermolecular forces we'll have in these molecules and how they might vary in strength as we go down this group. Well, from the bonding topic, we ought to be able to remember that these will all be nonpolar molecules. They must be because they've got the same two atoms joined to one another, so there is no electronegativity difference between these bonded atoms. If they're nonpolar, then the only forces we have here are dispersion forces. And remember that dispersion forces get stronger as the electron cloud gets bigger. So because there are more and more electrons as we move down this group, the dispersion forces will be getting stronger and stronger. And so the melting points and boiling points of these elements should be getting higher and higher. And indeed, fluorine and chlorine are gases. Bromine is a liquid at room temperature, whereas iodine is a solid. OK, so we are indeed seeing this pattern of melting points. Now, remember, at the start of this film, we said that we were hoping by the, uh, that by the end, um, we'd be able to explain how the melting points of the alkali metals and halogens um, explain how they varied based on the nature of the bonding present in those substances. Okay, So it's a little bit of a uh, revision of some of the things we covered in the bonding topic, really. Um, and perhaps if it seems a little bit difficult to you, it might be worth revisiting some of the films from the bonding topic. But if it's still confusing, and if you've got any comments or questions that you'd like to make, please feel free to post something on YouTube or to come and see me and we can talk about it then.